Welcome to another episode of Chatting Cinema. Pretty exciting day for us. We are finally, we're giving our final thoughts and opinions on the Zack Snyder Justice League. We've talked about this movie in the past and how the inception of it was kind of insane, how it actually came to be. It is out now. You can watch it on HBO Max. We have all seen it. I'm Gianni. I'm Flynn. And I am Luke. And this is a movie. Yeah, it's it's a movie. It's, it's a movie. It's, it's certainly a movie. And I, like you said, you can watch it now. We can log on to our HBO Max and we can click it. So uh, that's pretty crazy, right? Yeah. Is it a movie? Like, <laughs> I it's sometimes like this isn't even uh, uh, we're we're going to get into stuff we liked. We didn't like this is going to be very expensive, but this isn't talking about the quality of the material at all. It just felt like something I had never watched before and i think part of that is um because there are certain scenes in this that have been recontextualized in justice league 7 2017 so it feels kind of weird seeing it in a way that doesn't because when you have like director's cuts right like blade runner has a bunch of cuts it has the director's cut the final cut and batman v superman has the ultimate edition usually it just feels like added material or like shuffling but this just feels like a completely separate entity but at the same time the same movie a little bit i don't know but we uh we set out to talk about positive things first we all had i think differing opinions and levels of enjoyment of the movie but we all had stuff we liked in there so that's what we're gonna open up with yeah i think so I'll preface this by saying that I think I'm probably the one of the three of us who enjoyed it the most. Yeah, I would say before we actually get into the positives, we should just kind of say how we look at it in comparison and overall, because we'll do a DCEU ranking video eventually. But right now yes. with the Snyder Cut in the fray, I'll say I enjoyed it a lot more than I thought I was going to. I went into it with an open mind just because I want to like it. I love the Justice League. I love the characters. So I, I was excited to see Zach's true take on it. And I definitely liked it a lot more than I thought. And I also rewatched Man of Steel and Batman vs Superman and the Justice League right before it. And I kind of gained a new like understanding and I appreciated those movies more, except for Justice League, not really that one. But yeah. <laughs> uh, Man of Steel and Batman vs Superman, I definitely they definitely grew on me more as I watched them right before. And it was kind of interesting to see all of those play out like back to back because I watched them pretty quickly back to back but yeah so i was definitely pretty middle ground about this movie there was a lot i loved and there was a lot i didn't like so yeah so like i said um i think i like the movie probably the most out of the three of us um and i should probably say that i didn't do exactly a proper rewatch the way like luke did i watched man of steel i think like two or three months ago and i remember liking it more than i had in 2013 when it first came out um, and I just watched Batman v Superman, the ultimate cut. That was my second time seeing that. And my third time seeing BVS as a whole, like a few nights ago, uh, the night before the Zack Snyder's Justice League released. And that's another one. Like I know Flynn has said that it's probably the most watchable of the Zack Snyder films in the DCEU. And I agreed with that wholeheartedly until I saw Zack Snyder's Justice League. And I didn't do a rewatch of Justice League. I have only seen that movie once. It was in 2017 when it came out. And ironically, I did come out of it thinking like, oh my God, DC is kind of on their way. And then you think about it a few days later and you're like, nah, never mind. Never mind. <laughs> I take it back. But yeah, Justice so that, League does not age well. When I rewatched wow. it and then watched Snyder Cut right after, oh my God. It was like so, a soulless thing that lasted for two hours yeah so so for me like going into Zack Snyder's Justice League I was able to really separate I think from the 2017 release and I was able to really take this as like all right this is the Justice League movie and I tried to imagine it as if I hadn't seen any of this before and I mean whether you like it or not in the in the opening credits it's a different movie. It's a very different take. Um, I think I said in a text to the two of you that I think it's an entirely new take on all these characters. Um, and I enjoyed it. I had fun in that four-hour runtime. 
So, but we'll get into that more. Yeah. As far as my overall thoughts on the movie, um, I, I didn't much like it at all. Uh, it definitely feels like Gianni said, you can tell in the opening, it certainly feels much more like a sequel to Batman v Superman than Justice League 2017 does because it opens with a scene for Batman v Superman just kind of recontextualized and, and reformatted. Um, but, you know, for me, and I want to preface like anything I say like negatively about this movie, number one, you know, if you love this movie, who am I? Like, love the movie. That's awesome. I'm really glad you liked it. And number two, I wanted to like this movie so, so bad. I did a written review for our blog and I did a bunch of pre-writing for it of just general stuff and contextual stuff. And one of the things I wrote that I thought I would copy and paste into the review was how I was going to eat my words because I really enjoyed this movie. Because I was so set up watching reactions and listening to reviews. There are uh, you know, a bunch of reviews I've engaged with, whether it was uh, James Whitbrook's written review for io9. I watched and Merle's video review. I listened to um, Mr. Sunday Movies and Nick Mason review it for the Weekly Planet. But, you know, it just, it didn't work for me and we'll get into it, but I think that it's victim of a lot of the problems that are present in Man of Steel and uh, Batman v Superman especially. Um, but yeah, you know, so I, all we all liked it. A, a differing level mine not much at all uh but that should make for a more interesting conversation as we're digging into it so yeah you know what? let's let's talk about a few like just technical things off the bat um, mm -hmm. and we'll see if we agree or disagree on that something that i really want to touch on is that four hour runtime and a lot of initial reviews that i saw before i saw the film were that oh you don't even feel it you know that flies by and so I went into it thinking, oh my gosh, this is going to be daunting. But I kind of agree. Like after about two hours in, I kind of took a break to like refresh on snacks and stuff like that. But I, was, I wasn't feeling that runtime yet. I was like, all right, I'm pumped to like see the rest of this. I like the way it's going. Um, I, was, I didn't feel that anything was dragging necessarily. Mm -hmm. And I feel like the four hours really added to the quality of the film at least for me because we get to see so much more than we saw in 2017's version and i don't know now if i would take anything out necessarily um the way they did in 2017 i don't know that i would say like all right let's cut this slice that i kind of like everything that's in here um so what do you guys think about the runtime i think uh the runtime when we first heard it we were like whoa like four hours of a superhero movie i mean the longest before that was three hours with i think B bvs's ultimate edition so um i kind of was feeling it like two three hours and i was like i feel like this could be shorter there was some scenes i felt like okay this probably could have been cut but you know what zach was putting in everything he wanted to and like flynn you said at the beginning of the episode this almost isn't a movie because it's not it wasn't made for theaters. It wasn't marketed like for theaters because theaters will literally tell you to cut time out of your movie. And that's why we get deleted scenes and director's cuts because the theaters tell you to stop. Zach was given no limits. So Zach put in every scene he wanted to. So this is kind of like a first in a way for superhero movies for sure, but maybe even movies in general, yeah. where we got like the completely unfiltered, this is exactly what the director wanted cut. And honestly, it's kind of cool thinking about it in that sense. And I don't think it was like a breeze for hours, but I definitely think there were scenes that kept pulling me back in every time. Every time I was like, oh, this is a dragon a bit. My boy Ezra Miller would show up because I think he killed it <laughs> as the Flash. It's a little preview of what I liked. And then also Ray Fisher as Cyborg. Like Zach said, he's the heart of the film. I wholeheartedly agree. And I think every time I got a moment with them, I was kind of like, all right, I'm back in. I don't care. Like, like we can see another lame CGI villain scene. Sorry guys, if you like them, but I'm back in, like, I like these characters. I'm still here. I'm enjoying it. And uh, yeah, I think also, I think the, the epilogue was a little much at that point. I feel like three hours and 30 minutes would have been cool, you know, just stop it right there. But overall, I, I think I kind of lean towards agreeing with you, Gianni, but 
I, I think I know where Flynn's going with it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I um I really felt it. I, I felt the four hours entirely. And I think I think an issue is that, you know, in filmmaking, a lot of how we feel about a film while watching it is is determined in the first couple of minutes. Like you can like you have context for how it's going and that does not in any way decide a, a final opinion on a film or anything and you know you could be watching a film and like not like it not like it not like it not really sure how you feel about it and then the ending just recontextualizes everything and changes everything for you and then you realize oh yeah I actually really did like that I had that experience with Saint Maud recently where I was like I don't know about this and then the ending just completely changed my opinion on it but I I really felt all four hours. Um, I did the same break as Gianni did. I uh, I stopped halfway through, and I think part of the issue for me was that the second half there the second half was better than the first half. I I really didn't like much of the first half at all. So that. I think really added the fact that it, it kept dragging on. Um, but, you know, like Luke said, I'm really glad you brought up like the fact, like how different this was and, and how there wasn't anybody around to say no to Zack Snyder, right? Like he can put in everything he wants. And I think that ultimately was the right decision, especially because, you know, we don't know going forward what the DC film universe is going to look like. So if you think like this could be my ride off into the sunset, damn right put it all in throw it all on the wall but that doesn't necessarily translate to a a better or good film and i think a lot of times editors are there for a reason because directors are really the drivers of a film it's such a collaborative process but at the same time like a director imprints so much of themselves onto a film that they might have a harder time saying uh, maybe this wasn't necessary. Maybe this doesn't add much to character that I think an editor could have. So, you know, <laughs> I don't know necessarily that I'd, I'd be jumping to watch a recut version of Zack Snyder's Justice League that's two and a half hours long, something like that. But I think ultimately for me, it would be a better film because I thought the, the runtime kind of made it slog a bit. To add to this whole point, I think they should have went with the six episodes, how they originally said it, because the way it felt was almost like a movie borrowing themes from TV show storytelling. And almost as if it was like, this episode is the Flash's introduction and how Bruce ends up recruiting him. This episode is the Cyborg's introduction and how Wonder Woman ends up recruiting him. Like it almost felt like there was a structure built in, not necessarily the parts he did, because I think the parts were kind of weird placement for me. But yeah, I think the six episode structure actually would have benefited it for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, and if they did it over six weeks, oh my God, the internet would have been ablaze over that. Like, I mean, how WandaVision was, people couldn't get enough of that. But I think the thing we ended up with will forever be such a monumental release in movie history of like, wow, that actually happened. Like it actually went down the way it did. So, uh, yeah, I mean, four hour runtime. We were all shocked when they announced that. <laughs> we really were. And like when they said the six episodes announcement, we were like, whoa, like every single time it was just kind of a shocking announcement. But yeah. hey, I mean, there's a four hour movie to be watched now. Yeah. So I think maybe we should start getting into some of the nitty gritty of the things we did not like about the film. Um, because like I said in the beginning, I think I've had the most positive reaction to it of the three of us, but Mm -hmm. even I have things in there that I'm not a fan of, and I think I could do without on a second viewing, but I will say I I was the first of the three of us to see this. And when Luke and Flynn were watching, I asked them for three word reviews. I think it was about halfway through their viewings. Um, and Flynn's was, uh, quintessentially Zack Snyder and I don't want to speak for you, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you meant that as a positive and a negative. Yeah. yeah. And for me, I think that is probably the best compliment if I'm Zack Snyder that I could receive because yeah, it sure. absolutely is. Because the way I see it is if, and Zack has said, this is his last DCEU film. Mm-hmm. If it is, I mean, what a way to go out. <laughs> like, honestly, yeah. it, it's just about every Zack Snyder trope, you know? Yeah extremely long 
slow motion out the wazoo. Um, for me, uh, very weird things kind of in the mix. We'll talk about like Aquaman has an interesting kind of intro scene. <laughs> yeah. Those, but those are all Zack Snyder isms, you know, and, and for me at least in this four hour cut of a three year old, four year old film now, it worked. I had fun. I enjoyed it. Um, but anyway, let's get into some of the well, things we did I, not love. I still love. think there's some things that we should talk about we liked because, yeah, honestly, I cannot give enough praise to Ray Fisher for his mm. performance in this movie. I really think that see, that's the biggest difference by far between the two films is how his character is introduced and his role in the film. And I think he killed it in this movie. I think... His story was what kept me interested the most out of everything that was new material, but also thinking about how the 2017 Justice League handled it. It's like, did Joss Whedon read the script and just say no, and then just completely change it? Because it was so radically different, and especially his scenes. But then also, like, uh, Flynn, I think you said it, you were surprised at a lot of the Flash's lines that still were in the movie that you thought were Whedon lines, but they really were Snyder lines. I think the flash translated so much better in this movie, literally just down to the point where they, he said like, dad, I was one of them. And like his big triumphant moment at the end, like, Oh my God. Like, how do you go from like, somebody says this character is like creepy in 2017 to making him like really likable in the new cut. And then also somebody who was almost non-existent in the 2017 cut. And I think his CGI even looked a lot better in this cut as well as opposed to the 2017 movie for cyborg like those little things were definitely what made me happiest that i did watch it in the end just because i think they handled the characters or at least certain characters better because in the same regard i feel like wonder woman kind of took a back seat in this movie and that was a shame because she's the best member of this iteration of the justice league and you fight me on that but she just is like gal gadot is perfect for the role her introduction movie is probably the best movie, like not our opinion wise, but like the best movie itself out of the universe, I would say. So um, I feel like that's just one of the craziest parts to me is how different each character was handled. Like how you said about Aquaman too. Yeah. Um, so this is a good way to just kind of combine what both of you were just touching on but like gianni said i said it was quintessentially Zack snyder because it felt so specific to him and one of the things that's most frustrating to me as a filmmaker as with Zack's body of work especially as it pertains to dc stuff and i'll include watchmen in that but like i feel for every billion decision there's there's a poor decision um but let me let me touch on this the stuff that Luke just said positively first. Um, if Ray Fisher was presenting his case that he was mistreated um, on the set of Justice League in 2017 after um, Zack Snyder had left and Joss Whedon took over, this just like his case, like enter it into the court of public opinion because it for me like i was already on his side like knowing kind of who joss was behind um i was already on his side but this movie like like luke was saying his role is is so different and so expanded in this it the cuts really do feel spiteful from Justice League 2017. They do feel like, you know, we don't want to give this guy the light of day. And I think that it will, no matter what happens in Ray Fisher's career in the future, like there's going to be reverberations from that because if some version of Justice League comes out in 2017 where Zack is in charge and Cyborg kind of gets due, no matter how long that that runtime is, I do think Ray Fisher would be in stuff that he's not now because he doesn't have a role to play in 2017. Um, So there's one scene I really like uh, from Cyborg, which is his line where he says, I'm not broken, I'm not alone. Um, I thought that was a really good moment, even though like, I I didn't really like the whole, like the mother boxes were like witches thing. Like, 
whatever. <laughs> um, but I, I did really like that line, and I thought Ray's performance was solid. The Flash, okay. Um, Ezra, that, that scene at the end is the best scene in the movie. The, the Speed Force scene where Barry says your kid was one of them, absolute best of the best. Like, I think by far the best scene in the movie. I, I think it's like night and day better to everything else in the movie, quite frankly. Um, and it really doesn't make any sense that it's not in the 2017 version. Because you sets it up with Barry talking to his father, Henry Allen, in prison. And he says that dialogue, which is the payoff for the, the Speed Force scene. But... So there are a lot of really puzzling decisions like that in the 2017 cut where it almost feels like sabotage a little bit. I don't know. I'm not like a conspiracy theorist, so I'm not really going to get into it. But um, yeah, like that, that scene, I think it looks great. I think the effects are really great in that scene because I think the VFX in this movie are really up and down, honestly. Like, I don't think it looks as good as Batman v Superman does. But Ezra Miller's Barry Allen, like Luke said that I'd said before, there's so much of it that I thought for sure was Whedon to me. Like the whole, like, what are your superpowers again? Joke. And, and Bruce responds, I'm rich. I was like, Oh yeah, that's definitely, that's definitely Joss Whedon. Like no way it's not, but it was Snyder. And so like, I think the core of the character, like I'm not super on board with it really didn't. I don't mind like reinterpretations of characters for cinema because like, yeah, do it. Like, I don't care. Ch change whatever you want. Like, it is what it is. But th this is just, like, not Barry Allen. Like, <laughs> he's, like, this... He's super smart, but, like, not? <laughs> I don't know. Like, Barry Allen, to me, like, didn't... It didn't really feel like I was watching Barry. And I, I think that this movie could have benefited by maybe turning uh, Ezra's version into Wally West instead of Barry Allen. Um, but... Yeah, and then there's the hot dog scene, man. Like, this is just, this is, again, quintessential Zack Snyder. Like, you have an amazing Speed Force scene that, that pays off dialogue from before, looks great, awesome character moment, all of this. And then you have this hot dog scene, which is one of the weirdest things in the movie. Like, he's saving Iris in slow motion, who it's never said she's Iris. She doesn't have a line of dialogue. The only reason we know she's Iris is the fact that Kiersey Clemens is playing her and Kiersey Clemens was cast as Iris West and she's going to be playing Iris in the, the Flash movie if slash when we ever get that. And they share like this really weird like meet cute where they're staring at each other and no words are said. And then there's a slow motion crash you don't feel the weight of Barry's powers because half the movie's in slow motion. And he's like caressing her face and plucking hot dogs out of the air and putting them in his pocket. And there's like slow-mo focuses on sesame seeds. Like it's one of the things to me where I just felt like you probably know what you're going to think of this movie. It, maybe not, but if you really love Zack Snyder's work, like that feels very much like a Zack Snyder thing to do. Oh, so you're probably going to like that. But for me, it was just like, it just served to be like, okay, this movie's three hours. Did we, did we really need four hours? Did we really need something like this in here? Could we have set up the flash another way? But those are like specific stuff. We'll get into other stuff later. <laughs> yeah. Kind of to counter what you're saying, which is kind of a new thing on chatting cinema. Generally we're all <laughs> kind of on the same page and like feels weird, but it's also fun. I liked that scene. The only thing I really disliked was that it was entirely in slow motion. I feel like if that was the scene where we see truly how fast Barry is, that would have been great. I laughed at the joke when he pulled the hot dog out and gave it to the dog. He's like, I carry meat sticks. I'm like, this is dumb, but funny. Um, but yeah, I, I can definitely see what you're saying. If It might have worked better if he was Wally West. But also, I think partially what influenced Snyder in his portrayal of Barry is that he kind of established everybody else as being much darker and serious characters. And even though Snyder is always insistent on darker stories, he still does like to have somebody there that brings some light to it. And the flash definitely is a character that can do that. And in the same regard, Grant Gustin's flash on TV is kind of an unbeatable performance as textbook Barry Allen, like from 
here on out in all of history of TV and movies, I don't know if we'll ever get somebody that nails the character just like the creators of the character intended, like Grant Gustin does on that show. So I kind of like how Barry gets a different interpretation here. But again, I would have also liked another Flash to get a shot because there's so many people who take up that mantle. So if you did want to do a different style character, a different character could have worked. But again, right. Zach's doing his thing. He wanted Barry to be funny. Yeah, sure. So um, yeah, I, and again, I really want to emphasize that I wish that scene wasn't in slow motion. I think Flash's powers being in slow motion in the final scene would have been the most effective use if we we're only using it once. I think the constant use of it is almost like, okay, are we just doing Quicksilver from Days of Futures Past here? Like, yes, that was a great scene in Days of Futures Past, but like for a four hour movie, every time the Speed Force is used, we never actually see how fast he is. Like that was a, that was a little frustrating because I mean, I've gone on record of Twitter and this podcast saying how much I freaking love the Flash in this movie. And I just, I do wish we really got to see that because that scene in particular, I do agree is one of the ones that's kind of expendable, but I think you can also save five minutes of it by making it not in slow motion. So this might be a really hot take and I'm going against the grain of both of you here. Um, so I'm going to duck and dodge after I say this before I'm attacked by like a slew of Zack Snyder fans. But um I'm not crazy about the, I guess you could say, I want to say the third act, but really it's like the fifth or sixth act of that film. Yeah. But uh, I wasn't crazy about that final battle sequence with Steppenwolf and Darkseid and the Justice League. Um, and this gets into kind of some of the things I did not like about the movie. Um, I don't think that Batman's sort of sacrifice at the end pays off. Uh, I was not wild about the effects of that part of the film, yeah. whereas I liked the way the rest of it looked, but everything else in that sort of final act just felt as close to 2017 as it gets in that movie, I think, mm -hmm. as far as like looks, tone, um, minus like the red color grading that Josh Dreadful. thought was a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Um, I don't know the final act for me maybe it was because it was 2 a.m in the morning when I was watching it but I was tired and I was kind of over it at that point and I felt that that might be the only part of the movie for me at least that felt like it was dragging a little bit um whereas I thought I thought the build-up was really good I I really liked Steppenwolf in in this version of the Justice League I feel like his character was way more fleshed out um and I really liked like this technically would have been our introduction to Aquaman, only our second real viewing with like Wonder Woman um, yeah. and an introduction of Cyborg and the Flash, like Barry Allen. That was, I thought it was all really well done um, setting them all up. So, but yeah, the final act for me just didn't do it. Yeah, I mean, I think something to specify, I don't really like the final battle. I just like the Flash's part in the final mm. battle. I feel like the final battle it kind of suffers from what most superhero movies nowadays suffers from is it's how can we actually film this? Let's just use CGI. And mm -hmm. I get that this movie was ex extreme circumstances of reshoots and things like that. So no, they can't have a set and they can't film at all. But I do think that it was at least better for me this time around than, uh, than 2017s. And also I a hundred percent agree about Steppenwolf. I literally texted you guys like 20 minutes into the movie. I was like, I still hate Steppenwolf, but I ate my words because Gianni was like, no, no, you got to watch. I'm like, all right, you right, you right. And by the end, he actually had motivation. There was a reason for him to be searching for the mother boxes aside from awakening mother, like, yeah, oh God. Yeah. which was just so <laughs> weird in the 2017 version. But I, I also saw a really funny tweet that said movies that totally sucked that used cubes too much. And it was Transformers, Avengers, and this movie. <laughs> so that, that's a fun little tidbit because there are people on the internet who just hate everything. So they're MacGuffin box. <laughs> yeah. So um, I, I think that Flynn, you kind of summed it up really well where with Zach, there's a brilliant decision and then there's a bad decision that goes with it where I feel like these scenes, like this was such a roller coaster where like one scene I would be like, holy shit, the Justice League. The next scene I'd be like, holy shit, why? <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. And I know a lot of people will say it's like a perfect movie and I'm very glad that y'all enjoyed it that much. 
but I think it's good to be able to criticize it because even though we seem like we're MCU shills on this podcast, we we criticize the MCU. So um, yeah, I think also uh, the scene that we haven't really mentioned yet that I want to bring up is uh, Lois and what we thought was Clark's mother, uh, yeah. which turns out to be Martian Manhunter. Mm. I I felt uncomfortable watching that scene because at first we're not supposed to know it's Martian Manhunter, obviously. And that conversation felt completely wrong. Like it just felt so odd, like, cause they had really good chemistry in Man of Steel, I thought. And in yeah. that BVS, like I thought they were both great choices for those characters. And then this movie was like, what the hell was that conversation? And then when she walks out of the room and her eyes glow red, I'm like, okay, is this homie really just here watching? Like he's, he's going to see one of dark side's main minions pop out and he's not jumping out to help fight. Like obviously they couldn't have added him to the final fight scene. So I think they should have just taken that scene out entirely and kept the final scene with him. But yeah, yeah. I don't know that one. There's a lot to unpack with that scene. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Let me, let me give my thoughts on the, the third act and, and Steppenwolf and then I'm going to dig into uh Martian Manhunter a bit. Um, you know, I, I echo some of, what you guys are saying, I, I definitely th- this is one of the one of the parts for me in the movie that like has a, a specific uh, like section of the 2017 film to compare to. It's it's really not all that different, in my opinion. Um, looks wise, it's night and day for, for this scene, especially the the red like color grading in the 2017 version feels like the movie strapped on boxing gloves and is punching your eyes as hard as it can. Like it is borderline unwatchable, but so this version looked better, but yeah, like, like you guys are saying, I mean, it, it didn't really feel that different. You have the, the flash scene, which is really good. And the cyborg scene that I talked about, which is really good. And cyborg has a purpose for it, but like Superman's just there and, and kicking everybody, kicking Steppenwolf's ass at least. And it's like, ugh, okay. Like, the, the power levels in this movie really don't make sense. And that's like nitty gritty in the weeds, like dumb stuff. This really doesn't matter in terms of a movie, but like Ares beats dark side and Ares has been beaten by wonder woman and dark side is much stronger than Steppenwolf. So why is wonder woman not really taking it to Steppenwolf? I don't know, man. It's, it's whatever. Like it's, it's a third act of a superhero movie, but I, I just thought at that part, it was like, like thank god this is coherent because the first parts to me were like genuinely borderline incomprehensible because of the structure like the prologue especially i think sets you up for the film in such a poor way because it's like okay here's the recreation of batman v superman superman death and he's doing the super sonar scream and let's watch wonder woman react to it let's watch batman react to it let's watch cyborg react to it okay we're on themyscira we're looking at the mother box there. There's Amazon's just guarding it. Are they always there? I don't know. Who's to say? Doesn't matter. Let's go to Atlantis. They have a mother box there. Let's go to Batman. He's recruiting Aquaman. It's not going to work. Let's then watch Iconic Folk singing for five minutes as somebody sniffs Aquaman's sweaters. Like I, I really, I really did not like the opening to this movie at all, and that probably hurt how I feel about the rest of the movie and also the fact that there's the 2017 cut because ultimately my main opinion comes down to the fact that I do not think this is all that different of a movie. I, the character beats don't like blow me away and work in a way where I really connect with Um, the main plot is identical. Steppenwolf is there. Steppenwolf is better, but like I really wish they would have leaned into what a goofus he is. Like he's, like the worst <laughs> like Zod is just like him on every facetime call and like they has of it and was all sad like when dark side joins the call he takes the spikes off the shoulder and like all that but man like he didn't work for me in this movie either so that's steppenwolf that's the third act martian manhunter okay um first of all luke you mentioned that you would have just kept the last scene in there and what's fascinating to me about that is that was not supposed to be martian manhunter that was supposed to be john stewart yep so number one i think that indicates that like dc 
is being genuine when they say they're probably moving on if they wouldn't let him just throw John Stewart in there. But so it's Martian Manhunter and it's like it was confusing to me because like I maybe this would be explained in a, a future iteration of the the universe. I don't know, but like how long has Martian Manhunter been there? Did he know Thomas and Martha Wayne to be able to say that they would have been proud of Bruce? Is he just monitoring everything? Kind of a dick move, never jumping in, honestly. Kind of a dick move, Martian Manhunter. <laughs> That's what I'm thinking too. Especially if he's been here this long. Because I, I just don't think there's a an explanation that makes sense for me. Because if he's been here a very long time, and enough to like know who Thomas and Martha Wayne were and like have that genuine interaction with Bruce Wayne. It's like, it really took you this long to figure out you had a stake in this planet. You live here, bro. This is your home now. Like you're a transplant. <laughs> Find that stake a little bit quicker. You're Marsha Manhunter. But if it's not, and he's just been around since like Man of Steel, I don't know. Like what's going on where he, he tells Bruce that, his parents would have been proud of him. And where is that general that Harry Lennox plays? Is that guy dead in a ditch somewhere? And Martian Manhunter saw his face down corpse and is like, oh yeah, that's good enough. I'll do this. I'll I'll look like Harry Lennox. I don't know, man, but that that scene is not as as bad for me as the the Martian Manhunter Lois scene. That one felt strictly like fan service. I I knew what it I didn't know what it was in the moment until Martha walked out of Lois's apartment because I had seen the shot in the trailer. How do you know that the name? red eyes? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I had seen that shot in the trailer with the red eyes, and I was like, "Oh, the Martian Manhunter scene." And you know what it's I think? Nothing. You know what I think is the most frustrating part about that scene is that that's a character that is so freaking cool in the comics. He is a mainstay of Justice League Unlimited, like one of the best parts of that cartoon. And every single time he's appeared in anything, it makes me genuinely so excited. Like just video games to like cartoons, things like that. I was so excited to see him in this movie and he didn't do anything like yeah. at all. Like you could have had him fighting somebody else somewhere else and just made an entire CG fight. And that would have been like 15 minutes and take out some of those other weird scenes. I would have liked that better. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And ultimately, like, I mean, the whole point of the scene is is getting Lois back into the world. Right. Like That's that's what John says outside the apartment. But like, does he really like she says that's her last time coming to visit the sculpture when he goes there and, and hands the uh, the police officer his coffee. But I mean, I think the thing that gets her back into the world is the fact that while she's there, Clark bursts out of the ship like that. I, I don't know that it just it felt it felt so purposeless to me. And there, there's a lot in this movie where like I, I'm very curious what would have happened if this was like a genuine movie. And I could have like watched it in 2017 and it was Zack Snyder's Justice League cut to an actual runtime with a lot of the stuff cut out. Like, I don't know, man, this so much of it just felt like meandering to me. And like I said, you know, I, I've talked to a couple of people that watched it that hadn't seen the other DCEU films like the Batman v Superman and Man of Steel to set this up they just watched this because you know we were all talking and it was incomprehensible to them like they couldn't figure out what was going on at all so like I, I don't know who's going to watch this movie that doesn't know that I feel like there are certain movies and you know again like Luke said not wanting to be an MCU shill or anything or like saying like, this is how Marvel does it. And this is the right way. There isn't a right way to do that. And that's something that a friend of the pod Brown table said in his really excellent video on the Snyder cut that, you know, I seriously recommend you check out, but like infinity war, if you just go to infinity war and you hadn't seen any of the Marvel movies, like there might be some confusing stuff here and there, but I think you, you would get it right. And there's stuff that you wouldn't, connect with 
that audiences that have watched everything that connected with, but it doesn't hurt the movie in any way. That's just additional stuff. And I feel like if you just sat down and watched this, you'd be out by hour one. You'd be out by the end of hour one. There's no way. So that that's some of the ways I feel like it really fails as a, a film. Cause I think it like if this was coming out in 2017, would this have expanded the DC fan base more than the dreadful Frankenstein nonsense we got in cinemas? Nah, I don't think so. I think it would have had the same reaction to Batman v Superman. I don't think the critical reaction would have been nearly as positive. I I really don't. I think that some people are conflating great movie with better than 2017 and using that as a shield in the reviews like i'm not accusing anyone of dishonesty but like just to avoid internet hate like you can say with 100 percent sincerity yeah this is a better movie it looks better it's an actual artistic vision performances are better you know the whole night and then just call it a day but yeah <laughs> yeah that's a lot <laughs> There's so much to unpack with this. There really is. Yeah. I think, uh, I think in general, the vibe from us is that, I mean, at least Gianni and I, we enjoyed it. I did. I definitely didn't think I was going to as much as I did. And I think a lot of it comes from my craving of wanting good DC movies, Mm -hmm. because I don't think there's a universe where Marvel being the only good comic book movies is good. It's just not, you don't want one group making the best of something without somebody pushing on them knocking on their door like look what we're doing and i don't want copies where we get iron man or batman then we get captain america then superman like i don't want that i want something more along the lines of like like competition like there's competition just always makes everybody better and while i think at first dc was like all right we got to get in this game Here's Man of Steel. Here's BVS. Here's Justice League. If they'd really taken their time, maybe Zach would have made a lot better of a universe for more people. I think there was a, I think there was a way where if he took his time and like the second movie didn't have the death of Superman, we might like this universe just because I think the general consensus between us is it feels rushed. And even in, even in this cut, even in his cut, things still feel rushed in four hours, which is a crazy thought to have but it's true yeah. we're like all right hour one starts and by the end nobody is a justice league yet all right by the end of hour two we're kind of getting there and then by the end of hour three it's like oh we are the justice league we brought back superman to life we're fighting uh steppenwolf and dark side they're gonna destroy the planet and if we don't like it just kept building and building and i was like oh my god like like i, I don't know i feel like i'm kind of just ranting now but I did like it. I, I, I want to emphasize that, that I, yeah. I did. So, yeah. So, you know, I'll, I'll give some closing thoughts too, as we sort of wrap this up. But um, I, like I said, I think I'm of the three of us, the one who enjoyed it the most. I think that this is Zack Snyder's best DC movie. And it may be the one that I will be most eager to revisit uh, as the years go by. Um, some things that I still don't like that don't sit with me are again, that, that final fight in the end, I feel like it was way over long. Um, the effects aren't great on it. Um, and Batman's sacrifice just does not pay off for me. Uh, and something else I want to say, I think all of the characters in this justice league are a great improvement over 2017, but Bruce Wayne still feels like a guy who's just kind of getting the team together because he's afraid of what's coming, not so much because he likes these people. And that's something that I felt like really was prominent in both the 2017 version and in Zack Snyder's. Um, But with that being said, uh, there's so much about the movie that I did really enjoy. I did enjoy the introduction of Aquaman, of Cyborg, of Flash, um, Flynn has touched on this. Lucas touched on this, but like Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman is always amazing. She, she, in my opinion, is still the best part of this movie. Um, and, and I think that wraps up my thoughts. I think I'm good. <laughs> Flynn, before you go, I only have like a little bit to say, cause I just went on a rant. Um, I, I think my biggest gripe with the movie is the criminal underuse of Gal Gadot. 
I, I, I think <laughs> I mentioned it earlier, but she's so good. She's so good. And like, aside from the bank robbing scene and kind of that one fight, w- the really weird fight scene where it felt like the exact same scene from 2017 to now, but also different, the mid one mm-hmm. where they're saving uh, uh, Cyborg's dad. That one, like she was using that, but I feel like we still could have seen more of Wonder Woman. And I fully agree with you, Flynn, that if Ares could be dark side and dark side, like like that whole chain, Wonder Woman should have been able to throw fists with Steppenwolf. It just should have been a thing. Like I felt like it was just a convenient plot device to be like, oh, but we need Superman. But on the other hand, when Flash said he was my hero, when Ray showed this the hologram of him and like the way that they kind of, we're like, this is why we need Superman back. It was the first time I felt like he really was a symbol of hope in this entire universe. I never felt like he was a symbol of hope in Man of Steel. I certainly did not feel like he was a symbol of hope in BVS because it was just him wanting to kill Bruce. Like, like I, I was glad to see that translated way better. They took out my favorite Superman line, which is, I believe in truth and I'm a big fan of justice. I knew Zach would not have kept it but I still love that line. It's probably the only good thing to come out of 2017 Justice League. But uh, to kind of wrap up my thoughts, Gianni, I'm with you. I think they handled the characters a lot better this time around. I'll be revisiting this movie just for the cyborg and flash scenes alone. I might skip around a lot, but I definitely want to watch those scenes again. And uh, I, I think it's great that Zach got to make this movie. He got to go through this process finally. Hopefully his family can be in a better place now that this chapter of their lives got closure because what they went through is terrible and nobody should ever go through that so i'm really glad that it ended up well for the snyder family and for zach because i i mean we're all creators here and yes we're not making blockbuster movies but i think we all know how we feel about our own projects and the ownership we take of them and if you're suddenly cut off from that and like the whole story the i think it was the new york times article it really put it into perspective for all of us really what zach went through with the studio So as much as there was things I didn't like about the movie, I'm glad a ton of people love it. And I'm glad that there was parts I loved. So yeah, um, I'm going to eat some of my words. I'm not eating all of them, but I'm eating some of them saying like, yeah, I did like it. I did like the Snyder cut. So uh, that's going to get clipped. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So just, I'll, I'll try to make this as brief as possible. Number one, just continuing on this thread that, that Luke was touching on as far as um, Zach and, and that that final screen the for autumn and and uh setting the credits to hallelujah really hit me and i thought it was a really beautiful tribute and um it please don't take anything i say about this movie to think like it's negative about Zack snyder because i feel like he's genuinely a very good person and i think that ultimately no matter what led up to it releasing the snyder cut was the right thing to do um like luke mentioned there's a, a couple articles one that was really good was a uh a Vanity Fair profile on Zach written by Anthony Bresnikin that uh, I would recommend reading, but th- that really helped put everything to, into perspective for me. Cause I think that sometimes when you talk on the internet, like necessarily it's gotta be hyperbolic. Um, but at the end of the day, this is a real person with real hopes and dreams and real family and everything. And, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just my thoughts on a, a silly superhero movie. So you know, much love to, to Zach and, and Deborah Snyder and their entire family. And uh, I'm really glad that he got some kind of personal closure um, making this. Uh, yeah, at, at the end of the day, I just it, it really didn't work for me. Like the first half felt like a mess. Um, the characterizations, I think they were better, but but not in a way that really blew me away. Um I did like that there were like the inclusions of um, I think that there is a real reaction to Man of Steel and Batman v Superman where there was like an emphasis on heroes saving people. Like you had Cyborg with one of my favorite lines in the movie with you should probably move. Love it. (laughs) And he's saving people and, and Wonder Woman is, is singling out people to talk to. She talks to a little girl after the bank sequence, like all that was really good. I agree with you, Gianni, about the use of Bruce Wayne in this movie. Um, I, like, I, I don't feel like his character is is really that strong. Um, there are a couple lines I liked of him, especially everybody's highlighting the the Faith, Alfred Faith line. I really love that line, but to Gianni's point about Bruce Wayne, like, 
I don't think it connects with that version of Bruce Wayne that we've been like given throughout this this whole movie and this whole series. Um, but I do like the line. I actually really like Ben Affleck's delivery of the line. I think he does it with a lot of heart <laughs> and uh, that's really good. But yeah, like certain certain other scenes, like um, I didn't really uh, <laughs> I didn't really like the cyborg scene going through the Internet. Um like the money scene and like the ah, i get it it's it's money because the bull is fighting the bear like you know i, I got it already <laughs> like there's stacks of money <laughs> in the bank and silas stone literally says he can control monetary markets so there's stuff like that that feels uh specifically snyder-esque that that didn't really work with me and uh i guess there's one scene we have to mention that we didn't touch on mm-hmm. How how could we not have mentioned it yet? The epilogue. Whoo. Okay. Um, the, the deafening silence kind of says so, our consensus. Yeah. So the nightmare. I agree with people when I think the nightmare universe is is interesting. And to Luke's point about um, kind of taking time with this universe, I think that if they had kind of fleshed everything out with other filmmakers and then brought Zack Snyder in and did a Justice League movie a la Infinity War where like Dark Side wins, Superman succumbs to anti-life and it would really have to emphasize the whole anti-life thing because like if the idea is just that Lois Lane died and Superman killed everybody, I, I really do not like that. Um, but then just let Zach make the nightmare movie and then the end of it is going back in time. I think that movie would be mega popular. And I don't think we ever get it now because of how this universe has been built in the direction Warner Brothers and DC want to go now. But I think that if it was just its own thing and it was Zach doing that, Zach doing this twisted alternate reality version of these characters, I think that would have been really awesome to see. Um, but man... Jared Leto sucks. He sucks. He sucks as a person. And he, I don't know him, allegedly. <laughs> and he sucks as the Joker. That Like, I've seen so many people call this the best Batman-Joker interaction ever. You're oh entitled God. to your opinion, but I think that is the goofiest thing I've ever heard in my life. It's, it's not, it, I think it's the worst Batman interaction, Batman-Joker interaction, at least put to film. And it's just it's nothing to me jared leto's performance does not feel like a guy playing the joker it feels like a a dude who's drunk at a frat halloween party dressed as heath's joker trying to do an impression like it's dreadful it's poorly written i hate the reach around line Hmm. i hate batman ad-libbed by the way (laughs) he's yeah, yeah. I mean, I think Jared Leto just wrote his whole scene in this because apparently every line like, oh, that we live in the society that was an ad lib. The reach around was ad lib. So like, what are we doing here? I, j- I really, really disliked that because I think anything else, like I'm interested by the team they put together outside of Jared Leto's Joker. Also, I was, I was pretty surprised they brought Amber Heard's Mira back for a reshoot. That was something that stuck out to me because, of course, she was going to be in the the original cut of the movie. Like I expected that, but her being in the reshot scene was something that was really surprising to me. Um, but that team of like Batman, Cyborg, Flash, Mira, and Deathstroke, I thought was really cool. And there are so many DC villains that you could slot in there and be like, "Yeah, well, this villain's part of the the Justice League now." that's trying to go back in time to fix everything. Joker is not one of them, but he would not be part of that team. It doesn't make any sense to me. I don't like the performance. I don't like the dialogue. So yeah, that, that epilogue really served to, especially after it, it wrapped up the third act. And I know we all kind of gave our thoughts, but I was like, all right, breathe. Like having that there was like the movie had been punching me for three hours and 40 minutes and then took a break. And I was like, Oh, thank God it's over. And then just left the final haymaker right in the jaw for me with that epilogue. (laughs) Honestly, the epilogue was the only scene I genuinely hated. Like, I don't think I hated much else in the movie. There's things that didn't work for me, but 
to say like hate is just not correct about most of the movie i liked it but that epilogue scene literally was so promising until jared leto started talking and yeah. uh, like there's a lot of actors where i think it's okay if you like them but from what we know of jared leto he seems like such a sleazeball creep in real life like i feel like there's just something waiting to be found out about him like just from his personal life i mean he was the one who wanted to take the the picture of him looking like jesus dressed as the joker yeah. Yeah. like that's a red flag but <laughs> i think uh i think it's the worst interaction of joker and batman because batman like literally it is a thing even in the killing joke cartoon batman does not want to kill joker as much as everything he's done to him batman doesn't kill people he puts them away so they can't hurt anybody else and i don't care if you call me childish for not wanting a comic book character to kill somebody but i think that's extremely interesting in a relationship where joker can literally murder the people batman loves and batman still has the resiliency to not want to kill him and that line yeah. where batfleck is just like oh don't i'll fucking kill you <laughs> it did not work for me make no and, mistake yeah make no mistake <laughs> And uh, Jared Leto, who approved his laugh? Because his laugh sounds like a dying animal. Like, not a laugh. It sounds like an animal breathing its last breaths. And I I just struggle to see. Also, where did his tattoos go? Well, actually, I think that's just Jared Leto's laugh. Yeah. But... <laughs> like, where did the tattoos go? He had all those face tattoos, his entire body. Where did they go? Did, he, did the Joker <laughs> remove every single tattoo? And I know Snyder fans are going to be like, why are you complaining about where his tattoos went? I thought you liked Zach's attention to detail. Like, yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. To, to me, I, I thought like the, the tattoo thing could have been excused away by like he's putting makeup on now because his, mm-hmm. his skin is like like bone white in yeah. uh, Suicide Squad. That's fair. I really, I really didn't care because yeah, it, i mean i really like, don't it punch care me about it i'm just like saying it to be funny like where do the tattoos go and i will say about about this scene and about specific scenes that i've complained about uh, i've watched the film twice i you know like i didn't i didn't my viewing the second time wasn't like as attentive uh because i'd already seen it once and i was writing a review for our blog chatting cinema.wordpress.com Love. um <laughs> but I, I've watched the film twice because I was like, I watched it and I didn't like it. And a lot of people had liked it. And I was like, I am, you know, I can be wrong about a lot of things. I am wrong about a lot of things all the time. So I, I guess I should watch this again and like try and dig in. And that scene was the worst of the worst as far as how it played a second time. Like knowing, because at least the first time I was like, what is this even going to be? <laughs> The second time I was like, oh, my God. And especially seeing all the reactions about like best Batman Joker interaction, because I felt like a lot of it wasn't really genuine. Like I felt like a lot of it was just like we got a Zack Snyder Batman Joker interaction. Let's prop it up like, man, you know, you know that the (laughs) the Christian Bale Heath Ledger interrogation scene in Dark Knight, like it still exists. Right. Like nobody nobody got rid of it. It's still there. So go go back and and watch that like and please <laughs> tell me that this is the best batman joker interaction because again it didn't feel it didn't feel like batman or the joker really like batman is is being super edgy and talking about murder like you were saying luke and and joker is just doing this weird impression and i think part of his dialogue was to like reemphasize the fact that we are in a cinematic universe in this where the Joker has killed a Robin and it was supposed to be Dick Grayson because he, he drops that. And it's like, it's not a surprise because we saw the Robin costume already. So like we already knew about it. It just kind of makes it more confusing that Batman would seek this guy out. I mean, it's probably in the, the rest of the Snyder verse, like the explanation, like he plays a role somehow. I don't know. Didn't like the scene. (laughs) I will say, um and i might be wrong about this i'm pretty sure they only went back and actually filmed that scene and the one with bruce wayne and martian manhunter at wayne manor and those are the only two scenes that were added to this cut and then there may be dialogue added in 
spliced in throughout the film. Mm -hmm. But for these to be the scenes that you want to go back and add real quick, they suck. They they yeah. feel they feel just like that. Like they were just kind that of filmed was, for fun. Zach that was did one not of my get exact approval for it. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So <laughs> like, yeah. how was this the how was this the part that got added in? Because there's yeah. specific like when you're going through the epilogue and you see like um. I think I think this bits in the epilogue where um dark side has his hand on Superman's shoulder like there are bits and pieces here here and there that uh, are from Man of Steel and Batman v Superman and have just been spliced in of Henry Cavill's Superman because he didn't do any reshoots. And so like like you're saying Gianni like this was the thing that needed to be in there right this was man we can't even put out the film if we don't have this. Yeah. Interesting choice. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. I think that wraps up our thoughts, our opinions, our comments and concerns with Zack Snyder's Justice League. I can't believe this movie's out still. Like, I still can't really wrap my head around that. Um, and low-key, I'm excited to watch it again like, at some point. <laughs> uh, so, yeah. Uh, thanks for listening. Thanks for watching. I'm Gianni. I'm Flynn. And I'm Luke. And one more reminder, if you love this movie... We're happy for you. We genuinely yes. are. It's we all can have different opinions on different things, and that's what it's great about art. So, I think that's a good place to end. <laughs> <laughs> all right, we'll see you next time.